Luke Sandow is a name in bodybuilding that is honestly synonymous with depression and sadness, heartbreak. Luke was funny and a relief for many people in the bodybuilding industry. His no bullshit attitude and funny sort of whimsical way of going through life was appreciated by virtually everybody. Do I need an interpreter, Luke, or are we good? Interpreter? I don't want to. Nathan's in here. <laughs> His time with Bodybuilding and Bollocks, you know, the biggest podcast in bodybuilding, was a time that I honestly cherished so gratefully, and it was something that I used to get me through really dark days. Luke's flippant way of thinking about the world was something I could really just resonate with and made me feel a little bit better about my situation. It brought a calmness to the young and chaotic mind of young Colton. But today, I'm going to attempt to reveal to you who Luke Sandow was. As someone who either doesn't know who Luke is, or maybe just wants to relive a little bit of the past. How great he was, of course, but also his tragic ending. Buckle up and load your three CCs, and make sure you got your aromatase inhibitors with you, because we're gonna dive in a bit deep. I'm just the same as I've always been. Well, I mean, I'm the same now as when I was 10 years old, and I'll be the same now as when I'm 50. I'm just me. I'm, I'm lucky that people like it, because if they didn't, I'd be fucked because I don't know how to be anything else. Yeah, see, everyone says, oh, I like how real you are. And to me, that, that's a bit of a shame because I'm not trying to be anything. This is just me. And if, if people like the fact that I'm real, that just shows fucking fake everyone else's. Um, but I just do me. I do what I do. I've always been the same. I'll always be the same. And if people like it, great. If they don't, fuck them. <laughs> and that's why they love you. Luke Sandow was born on November 3rd, 1988 in England. He grew up in a really small town called Bournemouth, and from a young age, Luke displayed an amazing proclivity to athleticism. He often participated in a lot of different outdoor activities and a lot of music too. Luke's early fascination began with the whole superhero complex that we talk about so much on this channel. The heroes from Marvel and DC played a pretty pivotal role in who he wanted to be as a physique. Those early on chiseled physiques we all remember them from the old school cartoons, always brought this fascination with what if I could look like that? And I remember specifically for myself, it was like Goku and it was Naruto and it was all these animes plus superheroes that have these just amazing physiques that a male aspires to have. Now Luke completely and fully embraced this dream moving towards the physique that he had before he passed. And I have a, you know, a weird theory about why bodybuilders have such this clinging towards early early superheroes and animes, and I think really it has a lot to do with simply not having a superhero in their life. And so they have this artificial character that they can look up to and eventually even replicate in some sense. In a way, they can craft their own sense of security when they never had one in the first place. It's probably a damaged path, but a path that bodybuilders take to get to where they are at their heights. Now, as Luke entered his teenage years, he started to shift his interests towards music. He began playing the drums and eventually took his passion to a whole band like he was in a band performing live shows and the whole nine and despite the self-described stocky build he had at the time luke was trying to diet on canned tuna and carrots to fit in with his bandmates when they were on the road it's crazy and don't get me wrong i'm not saying that luke only played music when he was a teenager he still played the guitar and banged on some drums when he was just about to pass as well he was very keen on playing music actually. I remember specifically scrolling through his Instagram stories and every once in a while I'd catch him like doing something on the drums or on the guitar and I just kind of thought how unique that was for a bodybuilder because most bodybuilders are just sort of tied into what they're doing and their profession and their goals and don't really have time to express themselves in any other capacity but this wasn't who Luke was. Random trivia for those who don't know Luke was a rock drummer for how many many years? Several years. Yeah I I played drum pretty much as it was my job for about four or five years, yeah. You imagine him doing that now? I still play now. I still play. I still play. Yeah, I mean, if, if bodybuilding didn't work out, I'll just go back to playing drums. Now, Luke's transition back to bodybuilding was sort of serendipitous. His mother intended buying normal fitness magazines, but when she got home, she found out really quick that she actually bought hardcore bodybuilding magazines. This accidental purchase reignited Luke's passion for bodybuilding and specifically building a ton of muscle, leading him 
him to devour every piece of information that on bodybuilding specifically. The bug bit him, and once you have the blueprint as a young man, it's easy to work towards something. And you give a man direction and he will run. Oftentimes, men without direction have a lot of passion, but can't find a place to displace that passion. This magazine served as Luke's blueprint. He has something to chase now with this magazine. Love with all of his heart that he can now devote into something. He found a direction to place his passion in, and that is truly something you would all benefit from doing. And I think those of you who are bodybuilders watching this right now can resonate with something like this. You were probably young or old and found bodybuilding as a way of creating a path for yourself or carving out sort of a place in the world where you felt comfortable and safe. It made sense to try so hard at one thing because you now had passion towards something when you had passion towards nothing and that is completely valuable. At age 23, with just one year of structure training, Luke entered his first bodybuilding competition and won. He didn't just win either, he literally wiped the floor of all of the competition. I don't think I have ever seen personally anyone show up this fucking massive in any newbie show before. This victory was a turning point, convincing him that he had the potential to pursue bodybuilding professionally. Luke's competitive journey saw him participating in numerous competitions, gradually making a name for himself in the bodybuilding community. And that name was very clearly the Juggernaut, a name he crafted for himself by going through endless and arduous preps, being relentless and showing up show after show even when his top placings weren't so top. In fact, one of the worst shows that he had placed in, which was 15th place at the California Pro in 2018, was just the beginning of his season. After that, which most bodybuilders would probably feel pretty guilty and go back home and try again next year, Luke continued to compete for the entire year. The reason he placed that low, just as a side note, was probably due to some peaking errors. It's something I've talked a lot about on this channel and something that happens really frequently, especially at the highest levels of bodybuilding. And we're going to touch on this a little bit later. There was also the 2019 Olympia, where he definitely didn't place so hot. He placed 11th place. Still an amazing feat when you're compared to the best humans in bodybuilding, of course. But it was the similar issues with peaking correctly. Again, this is something we're going to touch on very soon. Luke's training philosophy was heavily influenced by the principles of progressive overload and high volume training. His favorite exercise was a deadlift, a testament to his strength and focus training regimen. Luke's diet followed typical bodybuilding cycles with bulking phases followed by cutting phases to optimize muscle growth but maintain definition and overall systemic health. Where things change a little bit from normal, you could call this a slight deviation, was his drug use. Luke actually talks a lot about how he dislikes the higher dose regimes that a lot of younger bodybuilders were doing at the time. He often talks about how training is more significant and nutrition is far more significant than any drug in general. It was quite literally the two things that he thought were the most important to focus on for a bodybuilder. He expressed many times on podcasts and in articles that he believes that the Dorian Yates way of cycling was the best way of cycling for most people. And for those of you who are unaware of what cycling means for a bodybuilder, this usually just relates to the compounds they're using in a cyclical manner. We all should know by now that bodybuilders use androgenic anabolic steroids or what we would call AAS or goes by other names as well, enhancements, PEDs, performance enhancing drugs. And when a bodybuilder cycles, this typically means they have a very high dose period where they're exposed to a very large sum of drugs and a lower dose period where they're exposed to a lower dose of drugs. Cycling on and off depending on the seasonal goals and what they're trying to accomplish when their shows are, etc. But Luke was foundationally set on the fact that Dorian Yates had it all right speaking on how the lowest doses would work fine. And even Fuad, when Luke brought this up, was kind of in disbelief. Does this kind of stuff rile you up? Like, because when I watch these videos, I'm like, okay, that's way more shit than I take. Oh yeah, oh, it always is. It always is. But the thing is, you'll, you'll tell a kid what you use and they'll, they'll just be like, bullshit. They won't believe you. The people spouting out the biggest dosages are the people that people are unfortunately going to believe because it sounds more believable. I think a lot of the problem is that I'm not sure if these guys actually train hard or eat either. Like as well as a bodybuilder would. There's no because my mentality is it is the training that defines you. Yeah. Like as a bodybuilder, you can fucking see it. So when I did yeah. the Arnold, everyone said to me like, "You you just look a bit different than a lot of the other guys. There's something different about the way I looked." And I was like, "It's just it's the training." 
Yeah. I fully believe that. Yeah. I, I think when you look at Phil Heath, it kind of, you can see how he trains. Yeah. Versus like Dorian or Ronnie, you can see it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and I think that's what a lot of people these days are lacking is the training. Now, we recently have gotten some feedback from what the man himself, Dorian Yates, was actually cycling. And it turns out to be quite a bit more than what he was revealing back when Luke was around. So I don't have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Luke talking about what cycle he was running, but I can disclose to you what the bodybuilder Dorian Yates was cycling back when he was a competitive bodybuilder. And he said quite frankly that his cycles were identical to Dorian Yates cycles and specifically his cycle for the Arnold Classic which was a show he placed extremely well in was this exact cycle which was said by Dorian about 1000 milligrams of testosterone 500 milligrams of primobolin 50 milligrams of d-ball a day and then he would also add in 150 milligrams of trenbolone per week as his total cycle for a show period now for those of you who are unfamiliar with pro cycles people who are on average 250 pounds lean this is actually pretty modest for certain parts of the year pros often run far beyond two grams in total without any issues one thing that dorian doesn't really talk about much was growth hormone it was relatively inaccessible with the time dorian was around it was highly expensive and very hard to come by and now it's a lot more accessible and you'll find that bodybuilders typically are doing growth hormone i wouldn't be surprised if luke himself didn't need much growth hormone but at this point when we kind of see it's a necessity in bodybuilding to get to a certain physique, I wouldn't also be surprised if he was using quite a bit. So let's just assume and make an ass out of me and you that he was running somewhere between 6 to 12 IUs of growth hormone, which is pretty spitting average for a typical pro bodybuilder who, again, is above 250 pounds lean. Some people really do think that this was the cause of his true death and not the alleged death, the, the heart attack, or the suicide. The one that most people agree on, though, is suicide. One Redditor said, whether it makes me a giga piece of shit or not, I am very curious if taking trend for a long period of time had anything to do with his mental health. Now, this is something I've touched on many, many times before, and you should now be aware, if you're part of my audience, what that can look like for someone. Trend easily manipulates the cognitive complex by actually changing the architecture of your brain. Long-term exposure isn't good for anybody, but it's certainly not good for somebody who's also concurrently experienced experiencing depression before using Trend. And we don't really know if this could have been Luke's cause of death. Was it suicide? And was Trend Balone what caused the awful, awful death of Luke Sandow? YouTube, sorry to bust your balls with an ad here, but I wanted to talk about something that's really important. We just started a private community called the Discord group. You've probably heard of Discord before. You definitely have heard of Discord before. We started this group with you in mind. It doesn't just provide a couple of resources, which I think you would leverage heavily in your bodybuilding journey. It does provide you coaches with direct access. Now, the only place people can directly access me is typically through coaching, but this is a new opportunity to where you can ask me questions as well as many other coaches within our community about everything you're going through. Not only that, but the community itself is lively. You can talk to people right now who are going through exact simple situations and complex ones just like you. And I get it, if you're not into that kind of thing, you could always just subscribe and maybe even click the bell button below. It's free and it helps out the channel a ton. Those are really the only two ways that you can help this YouTube channel grow. So I am sorry to pester you. I'll make sure to get my ass out of your face and get my other ass, which is in the future, past, future, future, me, uh, to talk to you now. Deuces. Luke was a simple man, and I really do believe he was a good man at heart. But I think we're kind of missing some of the main important points. Who was Luke? We've talked about his bodybuilding, his career, but who was he really? Well, Luke was a simple man. What motivated him was a farmhouse, a dog, wife, and at least one Mr. Olympia under his belt. It was his deepest desires and something he mentioned many, many times online. Luke was a family-oriented individual, often crediting his parents for their support 
throughout his journey. He had a very close relationship with his family and was known to be a loving father and a partner. One of the big things I honestly resonated again so much with with Luke was that he had a dream that was very similar to mine. Get a small little cottage up in the mountains, don't bother anyone, just have your bare necessities and make sure that life is okay. You have a small family to take care of, you have just a few things that you need to do every day that require some work but are certainly peaceful. That was his ultimate goal and he's made this very clear many different times that everything he did was in relation to getting that dream and capturing what he had developed in his mind as an idea of where his future was. Now of course there's tons of accolades we could go through about Luke. He placed second place in the 2012 British Finals, first place in the South Coast's men's category, third place at the 2012 Indy Pro, third place at the 2019 Arnold Classic, and these achievements underscore his dedication and impressive physique that he brought to each competition, and this goes without saying, I think the man was a highly accomplished bodybuilder, one that really tried to do his best to be as aggressive in the sport as possible towards getting improvements each and every single year. But it was only a small part of who he was. You see, there was obviously many struggles and tragedies that happened along this line. Despite his outward success, Luke battled personal demons and mental health struggles through his whole life. Friends and fellow bodybuilders like Ben Chow and Flex Lewis have spoken about Luke's internal battles and the challenges that he faced on a daily basis. Anything from depression to disputes with himself, he was terminally and internally very troubled. On May 7th, 2020, Luke Sandow tragically passed away. Initially, the rumor was suicide. His family later stated the cause of death was heart failure, adding a layer of complexity to his already precarious story. His friends came out live online to state things such as the heart attack was a result of attempted suicide, and that really things weren't as they were being reported. What his family said on this post was the following. Today, 3rd of August would have been Luke's 32nd birthday. As a family, we are finally able to give Luke our best and final gift. The truth, the cause of his death. There have been many dark days during the past 12 weeks. Losing Luke has left an unimaginable void in our family, and we will never be the same again. Again. Luke's unexpected death sent shockwaves through the bodybuilding fraternity. No official cause of death was released, which resulted in unfounded speculation and rumors. We can only assume that this was the reason that there were inaccurate posts purporting to know how Luke lost his life. Such posts, discussions, and comments have caused us additional suffering and an unnecessary suffering. Luke was an upcoming star expected by many to become the Mr. Olympia in the coming years. The bodybuilding industry is an enormously successful and financial financially rewarding one. In other sports, it is a requirement that the athlete maintains exceptional health and that the promoters, sponsors, and organizers actively assist this. However, we found no evidence of this. It has been immensely disappointing to come to the realization that Luke was perhaps little more than just a business opportunity. Please, we ask all of you to look after yourselves. This should be even more relevant with the knowledge that we lost Luke to a heart failure, not suicide. Now they go on to state that basically they opened a fund so that you can help the family out with more than just the cost of the funeral things, which was very interesting. And I have sort of an unsettling view on this post. It feels disingenuous, sort of making the watcher spectacle. After hearing hours and hours and hours of Luke, you kind of formulate the idea of who he is, and it wasn't just a flippant person that didn't care about his health. It gives me the vibes this is slightly misleading, and whether it is or not, I don't know. Allegedly, this is the truth by what is out on the news and what has been provided for statements. But unfortunately, there was nothing on the internet that I could find or get access from anybody else that detailed how Luke had died. It was pretty much locked tight. And one commenter said on the Instagram posts, this post seems kind of shitty to be honest. Whoever wrote it is also wrong about bodybuilders aren't looking after themselves. I and every other competitor I know gets blood done every year. That's something everyone should do regardless of if you're a bodybuilder or not. But only we are because how the fuck can we be successful in bodybuilding if we don't look after ourselves? 
How does that work? Hundreds of thousands of people die from heart failure every year, not bodybuilders. This post is sus. And even Scott McNally from the infamous YouTube channel commented as well. Scott goes on to say, I know a doctor that monitored Luke's blood work and spoke to him regularly. He was very careful and checked all his labs regularly. He was not an irresponsible juicer. He's being made out to be here. If you haven't watched Fuad Abiyad's YouTube video on the subject, go check it out. Someone is trying to change the story here for someone else's benefit. And here, I have to agree. It seems very odd to me that they withheld any true medical documentation and simply made everything virtually private. No public records can be found, as I had mentioned, and there was nothing provided outside of this post after his death. My two cents, and this is from the deepest, deepest part of my heart, I believe that he did play a hand in taking his own life. Luke was calculated. He didn't abuse drugs that everyone else did. And then having his family come out and provide a link to pay them money with a statement saying that bodybuilders are reckless is just sort of disingenuous. This seems like somewhat of a money grab, even though allegedly the money was supposed to go to the family. I just feel like the family was looking to cash in after a serious event, which they're entitled to if they need that kind of money to pay for Luke's funeral costs and the disposal of his body if we're getting very real, but it just seems like a very interesting way to go about it. I, I believe that if Luke wanted to die, he was the one to do it. I don't think he would have let steroids do it without knowing. And what Scott had said perfectly aligns with what I was aware of. Luke was regularly getting blood work, something that you should all do. And to be very fair, if you want guidelines here, I think bodybuilders should be getting blood work every 12 weeks. You should be checking a CBC and a CMP, but also getting far deeper, doing a urinalysis, checking cystatin C, CRP, getting your GGT done, getting methylation demands tested by homocysteine, testing clotting factors like troponin T, and many, many more. And if you guys need more access to information like this or want free blood work, my coaching program does provide it. I'm not saying that this is not like a personal plug. I'm just saying it's a great way to get blood work. Check these things out. Alternatively, what I typically have people do is go to Ulta Labs. Ulta Labs is a third-party website for U.S. people only, and you can buy labs and customize your lab panels there for very, very cheap. Go to the promotional tab at the top of the page because right there, they have huge discounts. And if you're saying to yourself that, man, I wish I could get blood work done every 12 weeks, it's just too expensive, this website was literally made for you. But that's my two cents moving on. Luke Sandow's legacy extends beyond his physical achievements. He was a mentor, a source of inspiration, and a beloved figure in bodybuilding. His story serves as a reminder of the importance of mental health awareness, especially within high-pressure environments like male-dominated professional sports. Whatever happened to Luke, or whatever you believe happened to him, I'm assured one thing. Mental health is by far the biggest issue with men today. We don't just deal with one or two men dying a year of suicide. We deal with hundreds of thousands. It's hard for me to speak on this without getting silly, but I myself struggle with highly intrusive ways of thinking very regularly. And to most people, a lot of men seem very successful, happy, and more than content. But all it takes is a single moment of loneliness, and it strikes you. It grabs you by the throat and throws you to the ground, and suddenly all of the weights in the world start to press down on your chest. It's hard to come up for air sometimes. Let's be honest, it's not an easy thing to do. So here's my personal advice. Never be afraid to reach out to your male friends. Not women, males. Tell them what's bothering you and be extremely clear and transparent. They need to know what's inflicting you. Because as you start to tell your best buddies about this kind of shit, and specifically males, those sandbags start to fall off of your shoulders. You begin to dump them on the side of the road and slowly but surely you begin able to walk again, doing so very slowly. One of the hardest things about Luke's position is he had quite literally hundreds of thousands of people who knew him and adored him. I have a lot of personal fans, which I think is crazy, and it's a really unique feeling because you have so many people who care about you. I can post a bad Instagram story about when my head's not right and people immediately send me DMs asking me about my day and how I'm doing and that they're assuring me life will be okay. And I can only imagine with the presence that Luke had, it was 10 times as much of what I get, if not way more. But all you need is that one solitary moment, that one sliver of loneliness that captures you and pulls you down. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that Luke had made was maybe just not expressing himself. But what I need you to do, brother, is stay strong. In other words, I hope
hope you are staying healthy. And if you ever need something, I am sure that right down in the comments section, there will be people who can help you. I included. The moral of the story, in conclusion, is that Luke was an amazing human being. He captured more than people's entire dreams within bodybuilding in a few years. And not only that, he had a heart filled with just joy and flippant, how would you say, discretion with the world. He didn't care about the things that everyone else cares about. He just cared that he was okay and the people around him were okay. And I think if we can all strive to do just that, we might just make it out okay. Okay.